And our call to worship online was actually Psalm 34, but rather than have me just read it this morning, we're going to hear it sung to us. This is um, Taste and See, and the the, uh, authors, composers, were Shane and Shane. I sought the Lord, and He answered me, and delivered me from every fear. Those who look on Him are radiant. They'll never be ashamed. They'll never be ashamed. This poor man. And the Lord heard me and saved me from my enemies. The Son of God surrounds His saints. He will deliver them. He will deliver them. Magnify the Lord with me. Come exalt his name together, glorify the Lord with me. Come exalt his name forever. Oh, taste and see. That the Lord is good, oh blessed is he who hides in him, oh fear the Lord, all of you saints, he'll give you everything, he'll give you everything, magnify the Lord with me. Come exalt his name together, glorify the Lord with me. Come exalt his name forever. Let us bless the Lord. Every day and night, never-ending praise, may our incense rise. Let us bless the Lord. Every day and night, never-ending praise, may our incense rise. Magnify the Lord with me. Come exalt his name together, glorify the Lord with me. Come exalt his name forever. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can be here this morning. We thank you that we can exalt your name. Help us, Lord, to experience the power and presence of your Spirit, to submit to the authority of your Word, to understand your truth, and to leave here changed. And it's in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. 
On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground. His covenant, His blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. sound. Oh, may I then in Him be found, dressed in His righteousness alone, thoughtless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. of Christ my King through eternal ages let his praises ring glory in the highest I will shout and sing standing on the promises of God standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail by the living world God, I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God, standing on Dean, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. Standing on the promises of God, standing, <laughs> fail, listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as is all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Well, thank you, Alice Ann. Thank you, Andrew and Winnie. Thank you, uh, Chris in the back. And Others who are taking on additional responsibilities appreciate everything that you do here. Now, someone wrote to me in, uh, in response to my Easter message that was online and said that they really enjoyed my joke that Sunday. And I guess it probably stood out because I don't tell a lot of jokes. And people have said, you know, why don't you tell some more jokes? And I, I do occasionally tell a joke. Uh, sometimes my snarkiness just comes through. That's a part of my unique personality. Some people find it funny in the midst of the messages, other people don't. I'm an acquired taste. My wife is only beginning to acquire me after 32 years. <laughs> but, um, you know, jokes are difficult because you know, 
People are so easily offended these days, and jokes can have unintended consequences. Uh, for example, uh, there was a pastor who really felt like he needed to spice up his preaching, and he'd never been a real joke teller, so he was always on the lookout for a good story or a good joke he could tell. Well, he was at a conference, and a person got up and said, you know, I have been married for 25 years to a wonderful woman, but I have a confession to make to you this morning. Some of the best years of my life have actually been spent in the arms of a different woman than my wife. And everyone kind of looked at him shocked. And he said, it was my mother. So the preacher got up the next Sunday and thought, oh, this is great, I've got a wonderful story to tell. And he got up and said, you know, my wife and I have been married for 35 years, and it's been wonderful, but I've got to tell you, some of the best years of my life have been spent in the arms of another woman. And he stood there for a moment, and he said, and I can't for the life of me remember who that woman was. <laughs> Jokes can be a problem. I'm just saying. Well, we are in Galatians 3. We're going to be looking at verses 19 through 25 this morning. And we are going to be talking about the nature of the law. Here is our passage. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed had come to whom the promise had been made, having been arranged through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now the mediator is not of one, but God is one. Is the law therefore against the promises of God? May it never be. For if there had been given a law able to give life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scriptures have imprisoned all under sin so that the promise by faith in Christ Jesus might be given to believers. But before faith came, we were confined under law, being imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. Therefore the law became our guardian until Christ, that we might be declared righteous by faith, and because faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you so much for your word to us and for Paul's unashamed commitment to your gospel. I pray, Lord, that we will show that same unashamed commitment in our own lives and you will help us here to not only understand the place of the gospel, but also the place of the law, what the nature of the law is. And dear Heavenly Father, I pray if there's anyone here struggling in their relationship with you or struggling to know you, that through the power of your word and the power of your spirit, you will help them and help all of us understand your grace and your mercy and your love revealed to us through Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. And our first point this morning comes directly from the first few verses of the scripture passage. Why then the law. Now let me explain why Paul goes here. Because this is a continuation of a longer argument, and he has been talking about the difference between law and gospel here in Galatians. In Galatians 3, 1 through 5, Paul pointed out that the law itself could not give us the Spirit. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly, publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now perfected by the flesh? The law could not give the Spirit. And then Paul goes on to say that the law could not make someone righteous. He says, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham in the Scripture, for seeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, And you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Blessing comes from the promise. And then Paul goes on to say in Galatians 3, 10 through 12, the law could only condemn. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. And finally, last week, we looked at how the law did not replace the promise. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. 
Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it is no longer by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So what he has been doing here is, once again, explaining to the Galatians who have false teachers coming in saying that you have to continue to keep the law even though you believe in Jesus Christ, he's saying there is absolutely no purpose to that. You know, it's not the things you did in the law. You know, following feast days, engaging in circumcision, doing all of these other things. Those aren't the things that save you. Jesus Christ is the only one who saves. Jesus is enough. Over and over again in Galatians, Jesus is is enough. And here he's talking about all the things the law couldn't provide. The law couldn't provide the Spirit. The law couldn't make you righteous. The law could only condemn. And the law could not replace the promise. So people might be wondering then, well, why do we even have the law? What is the purpose of the law? And Paul here is going to explain that to them. First of all, he says, the law reveals our sinfulness. It was added because of transgressions. See, the law shows both the nature and the will of God in addition to showing us how we fall short. This is what we read in Exodus 34, 6 through 7. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Here we have an example of God, both holy and gracious, and a reminder that sinfulness does get punished and sinfulness can have resounding effects on generation after generation after generation. But here is what the law does. It reveals God to us. When we look at the law, when we look at the Old Testament, we understand better who God is, but the law also reveals sin to us. This is what Paul says in Romans 3, 9 through 12. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. And Paul basically reiterates Galatians 3.19 in Romans 3.20 when he says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. We understand what is wrong with what we do because we have the law. The law reveals our sinfulness. But the law is also temporary until the seed had come to whom the promise had been made. And this is the whole point of the message last week. The promise is what is permanent. It was in place before the law. The law is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus Christ himself said in Matthew 5, 17-20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And the way our righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees is because we have the righteousness of Jesus Christ when we believe in him. Jesus Christ is the one who can keep the law. Jesus is the one, Christ is the only one who can become the perfect sacrifice and die on the cross for the sins of mankind. And it's when we believe in him that we are forgiven and we have a relationship with God. Now Paul goes on to say that the law is inferior to the promise having been arranged through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now, the mediator is not of one, but God is one. Now, that may strike you as odd. 
The law was given by angels. But it goes back to Deuteronomy 33, 1 and 2. This is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the people of Israel before his death. He said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. So there we see that apparently the angels are present at the giving of the law. And the Jewish understanding was that the angels were the one conveying God's message to Moses. And this is picked up on in the New Testament, Acts 7, 52 and 53. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, Jesus Christ, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. So the angels were there with God giving the law. And then in Hebrews 2, 1 and 3, Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how can we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Here the author of Hebrews is saying, hey look, if the message the Old Testament was given by angels proved to be entirely true, what do you think the message that has been given now through Jesus Christ is going to be? Well, entirely true, and we need to pay attention to it. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? So God used angels in the giving of a law, and he gave his law to Moses for the people of Israel. So what does verse 20 mean, which we read? Now the mediator is not of one, but God is one. Well, let me tell you something. Back in the 1930s, there was a biblical scholar named A.T. Robertson, and he was a big thing when it comes to Greek scholarship, and has wrote one of the greatest Greek reference books that is still mentioned in commentaries and writings today. So he also wrote a commentary called Word Pictures in the New Testament, when we went through the entire New Testament and talked about uh, what the Greek meant in various verses, and also talked about other things there as well. Well, for this verse, 320, now the mediator is not of one, but God is one, he said he knew of over 400 interpretations of the verse. 400 people trying to figure it out. And I imagine that in the last hundred years, there have been more. So it's not completely clear, and some think that it has some Trinitarian meaning and there's some deeper theological or spiritual meaning behind it, but if I was to give you my best guess and give you an expanded paraphrase of Galatians 3.20, this is what I would say. You need a mediator when multiple parties are involved, as in the giving of the law. You add God and the angels but in the promise, God spoke directly to Abraham. Therefore, the promise is superior to the law. You have the mediators at the beginning of the verse. The mention that God is one at the end seems to indicate that God gave the promise by himself to Abraham, therefore indicating once again that the promise gave, given to Abraham is superior because it was given directly by God himself. The promise is once again superior to the law. Because the law doesn't bring life. Is the law therefore against the promises of God? May it never be. For if there had been given a law able to give life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. Now, Paul kind of gives a commentary on these verses in Romans 7, verses 7 through 12. So let's look at those for a moment. What shall we say then? that the law is sin, by no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Now, Paul goes on to say something that's very important. He says that even without the law, 
sin is present in the world, and that is shown because death reigned from Adam to Moses. There was still death, which was a punishment for sin. The difference is that without the law, you aren't sure exactly what sin is. So the law reveals what sin is. The wrong desires, the wrong actions, the way we rebel against God. And the law then makes it known to us that we can't have a right relationship with God because of the sin that is already present in our lives. Finally, it makes it known to us what the punishment for that sin is. So the law, in a sense, makes us dead. Now you can say ignorance is bliss, right? I mean, if this is the way it is, it'd be better off not to know that you were actually a sinner and you're going to die and spend eternity away from God. But, you know, when you think about it, does ignorance is bliss really work in life? I mean, it's great to walk into a tunnel. Not so great if you don't notice there are train tracks that you're walking on, right? So ignorance isn't always bliss. Ignorance can lead you to destruction. And that is what the law came to do to point out that we were on the road to destruction. And Paul does it in wonderful figurative language here. But he's not saying that you know there was no literal sin until the law came. It's just we didn't realize what our sin was. We still paid the punishment for sinfulness because everyone died from Adam to Moses. But the law was there, so once again, we could know what sin was. But then the law can't be said to give life. It really makes us understand what miserable, corrupt people we are because we don't know until we understand who God is, what his word says, how we're supposed to behave. And then once we understand that, we understand that we are all under punishment. We are all guilty before God because of our sinfulness. Therefore, the law can't bring freedom. But the Scriptures have imprisoned all under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to believers. But before faith came, we were confined under law, being imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. Once again, we're back to the promise. You know, the law could weight us down with our sin. It couldn't take it away. What can take it away? The promise takes it away. The promise is Jesus Christ. The promise is the one who came and died on the cross for our sins. The law teaches us that we are literally the walking dead and we are in prison. We aren't what we were meant to be at the very beginning. And we can't be because of this burden of sin. We can't know love. We can't know joy. We can't know peace. We can't know contentment. We can't know purpose and we can't know meaning. We are literally slave to our sin, slaves to our sinfulness and desires. We can't know freedom. But we can know freedom through Jesus Christ. This is Romans 4. Oh, excuse me, Romans 8, verses 1 through 4. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. The law doesn't make us free. The law imprisons us. Imprisons us under sin. We're shown to be sinners in the hands of an angry God, to to, to quote Jonathan Edwards. It's the promise of Jesus Christ that sets us free. Paul goes on then to say that one of the main purposes of the law was that it was a guardian until we mature. Therefore the law became our guardian until Christ, that we might be declared righteous by faith. And the term there, guardian, is paedagogos. 
That's a mouthful, let me tell you. But it means teacher. It means um, steward who is in charge of the children. And what would normally happen is if you had a um, wealthy household in the Roman Empire, you would hire somebody to take care of the children until later teenage years. You think of it as a nanny. I mean, the parents are busy, the parents want to have their fun, parents, whatever. They need someone to watch over the kids. They hire this guardian. And that guardian's responsibility was to teach morals and manners and attend to them in their daily lives. You know, go about with them, try and make sure they, they stayed out of trouble and knew what they were supposed to do and how they were supposed to behave. The main point was that this guardian's purpose was to keep the child out of trouble. So in a very real sense, this guardian can be thought of more as a, of a, as a babysitter than as a teacher. This babysitter keeps watch over the children during their years of immaturity. Here we see that in a believer's life, the law can teach us what sin is. The law can show us that we're you know, responsible to God for our sins. The law can show us that something needs to be done, but the law can't give us freedom. The law can't bring us to full maturity. The law can't provide forgiveness. The law can't show grace. That all comes through Jesus Christ. And, you know, it's, when you think about it, it's not so dissimilar, this idea of the law being a, a guardian is not so much different than being a parent. I mean, we do whatever we can to try and teach our children what is right but we can't force them in their hearts to obey. We can help them to understand that there will be consequences for sin, but until they reach that maturity where they understand and want to follow, there's very little we can do. Now, I think one of the best illustrations we gave to our kids when they said, you know, we could still go out and do all these things wrong, you know, your rules and your punishments, you know, only going to deter us for a time. We basically said, we know that. We're basically putting speed bumps in your way, trying to get you, when you go over that first speed bump, to think, is this really a good idea? Or should I continue going 80 miles an hour before I hit the next speed bump? Now, the law can be a speed bump, but the law can't bring life. The law can't bring maturity. The law can't bring understanding. That all comes through the Spirit once we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And Paul finishes this passage we're looking at today by saying the law has a new purpose in the lives of believers. And because faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So, if we're no longer under a guardian, what is the purpose of the law in the lives of believers? You know, it brings up the question then, does the law have a place at all? And I would say the law still definitely has a place because we're talking about the Old Testament of the Word of God. And we see in the New Testament, it points to the law and the Old Testament as still having a place in the life of believers. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.8, now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, properly, rightly. And then, of course, the passage most of us have heard so many times in our lives, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. All scripture, and what's most significant here is that the New Testament letters were just beginning to be recognized and collected and wouldn't be as a corpus, a unified group, for hundreds of years yet. So all Scripture here is referring primarily to what we call the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible. So here Paul is saying that all Scripture has a 
place. All scripture has a point. All scripture has a purpose. So what is that purpose? Well, first of all, we saw it right here in our passage. The biggest thing is the law reveals sin. It shows what is wrong. It shows the types of things God doesn't like. And that's really, in some ways, especially important for a person who is a non-believer. I'm sure you've seen um, videos trying to teach you how to perhaps share your faith. And one of the ways you go up to a person and, ask, and, you, and you ask them if they've ever done anything wrong in their life. And they might say, well, yeah, I've probably done this, that, or the other. And then they share with them what Scripture has to say about doing wrong and how uh, you know, God is perfect and holy. And you know, if we've done wrong in his sight, we all deserve to be punished. And the only one that can take away our punishment is Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, so we have eternal life. So that's kind of a, a law-based, in a sense, approach to evangelism, showing people that they have offended God by the, the wrong that they have done, if they're willing to admit that they've done some wrong. I've known some people that have actually said, I've never done anything wrong in my entire life. I, I would then go and ask their wife, has this person ever done anything wrong? No, no, I'm sorry. So the law also serves, that's my snarky sense of humor there that is only, you know, only some people like. So the law then also serves as a guide, a guide. And this is, I think, the primary way we approach it as believers. Uh, the law as given to Israel has many components that were specific to the nation. I mean, we aren't worried about the civil parts of the law. You know, how, how to govern the nation of Israel. We aren't even concerned about the ceremonial parts where you might consider the sacrifices or the dietary laws. We don't think of those things. So some things in the law were given that were specific to Israel, and we already know that those aren't important for us. So some things in the law were given specifically for Israel. But the law also reveals eternal truths that the law to Israel was based on. And sometimes people call this the moral law. There were, there were some things that were given to Israel that are eternally true, and they were given specifically to Israel in a specific way to apply to them, but then they also apply to everyone because they're a part of God's eternal moral law. For example, is thou shall not murder something that was just for Israel? Or is that an eternal truth? Well, it's an eternal truth. And we understand that. But let me also point out that this threefold distinction is only useful to a point, this dividing the law into civil, ceremonial, and moral. Because even the civil or ceremonial parts of the law can teach us something. So we don't just throw them away and just say, oh, that was written for Israel. We don't need to read them anymore. They can't teach us anything. The sacrifices can't teach us anything. The sacrifices can teach us wonderful things about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, whom they foreshadow. So you see, we can still learn from those civil and ceremonial portions, so we don't just throw them away and say, oh, those were given to Israel. The law, once again, is good if you use it lawfully and you understand the eternal principles behind it. Now, for example, here, here's one that always fascinated me since seminary when I heard it. And there is a verse in the Old Testament that says, don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. Don't boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And you might think, well, why would, you, why would, why would that be a thing? And, you know, I've got to tell you, in, in Jewish tradition, that became a whole thing with the dietary laws. And you couldn't have, you know, butter on the table in certain meals and all kinds of stuff. But you know what... More recently, people have come to think what that means. They found some indications where this was something pagan people did that was a form of worship to their pagan gods. So in reality, this had nothing to do with dietary laws. It had everything to do with idolatry. So this innocuous verse that we might read and think, oh, throw that away, that means nothing to us. When understood properly, is a reminder not to engage in idolatrous practices and not to worship other gods. Don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. The law, the Old Testament, can be 
fascinating if we view it with the proper lens. But the biggest thing I think we have to understand is that we now, as Paul sees it, live under the law of Christ, led by the Spirit, which in a sense holds us to a higher standard. This is what Paul says later on in Galatians 6.2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ. And I think the law of Christ is actually a higher standard because we've been given the Spirit as a guide. And the Spirit coupled with the Word of God makes us into totally different people. This is what Paul later on says in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. In other words, the law can't produce these. The law brings death. The law brings imprisonment. The law doesn't bring freedom in life. The promise brings freedom in life. And that promise brings the Spirit which helps us to experience love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The law can't produce these. So Paul, once again, is saying, don't go back to the law. Stay with the promise. Understand how your faith started. Understand how your relationship started. Understand that it is only through Jesus. Understand that Jesus is enough. It's all about Jesus. Paul is trying to show that when we know Jesus Christ, when we believe in him, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. And that spirit is the one who helps us to follow God. That spirit is the one who helps us experience God. Now, does the Spirit use the Word of God? Of course the Spirit uses the Word of God. I mean, that's how we can most assuredly tell when what we're experiencing in our own lives, the message we think we're hearing, is truly from God. When it is coupled with what the Bible says. And when we have the Spirit, we live better. We do better. We act better. We have, in a sense, a higher righteousness than the law itself can give. And one of the reasons I say that is because of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ points out the need for a higher righteousness in the Sermon on the Mount. He's trying to show that by only keeping the law outwardly, outwardly, the Jewish people are missing the point. And by doing that, he shows the higher righteousness that his followers will be able to achieve. For example, Matthew 5, 21 and 22. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Then he goes on. Matthew 5, 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And our initial response might be the same of the Jews in his day. That's an impossible standard. Well, one of the things Jesus was doing is pointing out that even though they could try and keep the law outwardly, if they weren't keeping it in their hearts, they weren't really keeping the law. And therefore, they were all guilty of sin. But I think even beyond that, he's showing how people who truly are his followers can and should behave. Because it doesn't start with our actions. It starts in our hearts. And once our hearts have been changed, we can adhere, in a sense, to a higher righteousness than even the law can convey. It starts with belief, because that's when we gain the Holy Spirit of God. 
The Spirit gives us the desire and the want to. The Spirit prompts us. The Spirit reveals sin. The Spirit drives us to the Word. The Spirit drives us to prayer. The Spirit drives us to worship. The Spirit drives us to praise. And then the Spirit, coupled with the Word of God, helps us to be different, helps us to be better, helps us to be holy. But we can resist. We can. Scripture says we can grieve or quench the Spirit. And when we do, we continue to act like the miserable zombies that we were before. But that's not the way we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be full of life. We're supposed to be full of joy. We're supposed to be full of purpose, led by God through His Spirit, guided by His Word, living a higher righteousness in our own lives. Not hating other people in our hearts. Not looking for relationships outside of marriage. Jesus goes on in the Sermon on the Mount. I stopped here with adultery because Jesus really starts to get personal. And we have to understand that the Spirit of God inside us compels us to live for God. The Word gives us the guidelines that the Spirit uses, but we have to understand the Word properly. Even though the law is not, in a sense, even though the law does not have the same purpose for us as believers that it did before we became believers. The law is still important, and the law is still a guide. But once again, Paul reminds us here that if we take the law and we think of it as a way that helps us to gain salvation, then we've totally missed the boat. And then even our initial understanding of Jesus Christ may be suspect if we are willing to turn our backs on him. So the law is still good. It still serves a purpose, particularly for people who don't know God. It shows them their sinfulness. And for believers, it helps us to better know God. But it is not in itself the thing that gets us to heaven. That's Jesus. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you for Paul's word to us. And we thank you for the reminder that Jesus is enough and for the reminder that we are not under the law anymore as, as believers. We've been set free. And yes, the law can help us to understand your eternal principles, help us to understand how we are to live, but we now have the Spirit because we have obeyed the promise, we have followed the promise, we have believed in the promise, we have understood that Jesus Christ is the one who died on the cross for our sins and sacrificed himself for us. So help us, Lord, to live with that freedom, not with this burden of guilt, not with this burden of shame, Because Jesus Christ took all of that away when he died for us. So help us, Lord, to not turn back to the law and look at it as this thing that we we have to follow and we have to keep because it's something that will help us to make sure that we're saved. No, that's not it at all. But it does help us to understand how we are to live, even if in a sense it is insufficient. Because it can show us how to not act in a particular way, but it can't change our hearts. It can't give us the desire and the want to. That all comes through your, from your spirit, and that all comes because of the promise, Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to recognize that your spirit is the driving force. Your spirit uses your word, but your spirit helps us to be even more than the law could have ever imagined. And it's in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.